So what, what I'm going to talk about today is how to build an application that is essentially a little Twitter application. Okay? Um, we call it Yamba, which stands for yet another microblogging application. Uh, and that's basically what I did uh, in my book. I basically explain uh, in, in details how to, how to build this app through multiple iterations. Um, so we're going to um, talk about writing this app in, um, first. And then at, toward the end, I'm going to talk about how to write a similar app, but for the tablet. So this is the, the, the version of that app running on Honeycomb as well. So I'll talk about the differences um, along the way. Because Honeycomb is just, you know, provides a couple of new things, but it's not all that different. Uh, most of the best practices are still the same between the, the two uh, platforms. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit about this project uh, called Yamba. Um, hold on a second. I think I messed up with the screen. Um, let's, let's see which one it is. So, so we're going to talk about um, this in the context of those applications. So I'll show you first what those applications do so that you have an understanding of what the components are that I'm talking about. So, you know, we're going to start top down, talk about the app first, then boil it down to lines and circles, sort of the back of a napkin design, and then we can get to the actual code. But I'm not going to just jump into the code and, and, and confuse the heck out of you. So, with that, let me uh, just show you a little bit about these apps. So, this is the, the, tab, the version of Yamba, or the Twitter app for the regular phone. Um, basically, there are a couple of screens. There's one screen where you can see, you know, the timeline, what you what your people are doing. You can kind of scroll through it. Um, you can you can see the timeline. Uh, there's another screen where you can update the timeline. Um, you can say, for example, hello from SV Code Camp. Um, and what this does, it uh, attempts to post it. Uh, to, to the server, and it depends on the connection if it's going to work or not. Uh, typically, it would give us a, a feedback. Um, so, in this case, fail to post. It could be any number of network issues and firewall and stuff like that uh, because it's running inside of, a, of, of the emulator. But if, if it does work, it normally goes to a, uh, to, a, to a web server. And in this case, the web server is actually not uh, twitter.com. But we actually use a um, our own co controlled environment, which is um, basically adheres to the very same API as Twitter. But because if we do stuff like this in a, in, and everyone uses the same username and password, Twitter really quickly shuts us down. So that's why we wanted to kind of create our own private Twitter verse so that we can do testing. Uh, but it's exactly the same API. Um, so these are the, the posts from people all over the world that are basically building Yamba as, as an exercise uh, following the book. So that's the screen number two. And then there's one more screen in this whole thing, and that's the screen where you get to set the preferences. Pretty standard in an application. So you can do, you can, you know, update username, password, that sort of thing. Um, so these are the three screens that exist in this application. Um, other than that, there are also, there are some services and things that happen behind the scenes, which you can't really see. Uh, but for example, this is supposed to go online and try to pull the latest data and update your local your local database. Okay, so so does that kind of make sense um, in terms of the functionality of this super simple application? Yeah. So now, in the context of that application, um, we're going to look at a couple of things that that we have. So for, uh, one thing that we we have uh, are activities. So these are what they call the main building blocks or the sort of the Lego components that we use to build an Android app, right? So um, an activity is roughly a screen. So each of those three screens is, is, is an activity, right? So we have an activity for um, listing the timeline, activity for uh, updating the timeline, and the one for preferences. Um, as you um, um, sort of to compare activities to something you may know, um, I usually use websites, right? So an activity would be like a web page is to a website. Um, on a typical website, you usually have a home page, the main entry point. So do we with Android. So we usually have so-called main activity, the entry point. But it doesn't have to be the only entry point to the application. 
uh, just like the website doesn't have, you, you don't have to enter a website through a home page only. Um, what you need to know about activities is that they're heavily managed by the system. So activities have a rather complex life cycle. What that means is that it's sort of, um, you're programming in a container environment. Okay? How many of you did any uh, applet work, servlet work, xlet work in Java? Any of those? All right, so then you know what I'm talking about. So basically, your, your code doesn't do what you tell it to do, but your, your code rather responds to the events that happen that, that are invoked by the system. So it's, it's sort of like an event-driven programming. So basically what happens is at the beginning of the day, your activity doesn't exist, um, and you know, the user says, I want to launch this app, um, and along with that, the activity gets created. Um, at that point, it's, it's so-called running. It's visible. We can only have one visible activity in, in, uh, on the screen at any point in time. Um, this one gets all the preferences in terms of memory, in terms of you know, CPU cycles, all that stuff. Uh, because we want to have the sort of fast, speedy experience for the user. Um, at some point, the user may flip the screen, we go from one screen to the next. So what happens is this activity uh, gets paused really quickly and then stopped. Okay? So many, many activities, I'll put, uh, I'll put many here and this is one. So many activities are in the stop state. They're essentially sitting there cached. Okay? Now the system is at its discretion decide to kill an activity, just wipe it out, get rid of it. You do not have a lot of say in that. Okay? So that's where it's different. You don't say app quit. Right? The system decides when it wants to dispose of something. Sort of like garbage collection in Java, right? Uh, you can suggest, you know, system.gc, but it's, there's no guarantees for that. So it's kind of similar. You can suggest that an app is not, or activity is not going to be needed, uh, but it's just a suggestion. It's not necessarily going to adhere to that. Um, but at some point, the user may actually want to get back to that activity. So that's why we have, um, we can go back into running state. Okay. So the reason, so, uh, so basically you as a developer, you control these things. You control the transitions. You have the power to put something here, okay? That's all you can do, right? Uh, you do not control the state that your activity is in. So the system is gonna, you know, transition your activity from a state to a state. So it's kind of like a finite state machine, you know, in a way. Uh, so the reason why this is done the way it's done is that these steps, from starting to running, that tends to be fairly expensive. If you think about it, you need to, if it's a brand new application, you need to launch a Linux process, you need to start a Dalvik virtual machine, you need to load your classes, you need to uh, you know, inflate your XML layout, you need to uh, uh, start your Java. So all this, and draw on the screen. So all these things are fairly expensive uh, uh, operations. So, so there's a lot that goes on, go, uh, at the startup of a single screen. Um, now, because it's likely that the user is gonna come back to the screen, that's why we don't wanna just get rid of it. We wanna kinda keep it around so that in case the user comes to it again, uh, that transi transition is much faster. So basically this step here tends to be cents on a dollar when it comes to sort of getting back to the uh, some screen that, that has been already initialized. So that's a little bit about activities. Um, basically, they're heavily managed by the system, and uh, a lot of optimization goes into, into them. Um, another component that we have that's important in Android app development that you wouldn't have had in Java um, are intents. So intents are basically events or messages um, that happen asynchronously between these components. They're sort of the glue between all these main building blocks. Um, so I have, um, as an example, I use uh, uh, this simple, simple pattern. Um, so imagine that, imagine that you guys send me an email and it says, so I'm in Gmail. So this is one app, right? So I'm in a single application. So um, you send an email and so I'm, look, I'm, I'm in an activity in a screen that says this is a list of messages, right? Um, and so I'm viewing the list and now I see that there's an email from you. So I click on that particular email and what happens next is we fire an intent to launch another activity, another screen, that's gonna show that particular message, right? So we flip from one screen to the next, okay? 
Now, this is going to work slightly differently on, on Honeycomb, but other than that, everything is the same. Um, so, so that's an intent that, that made that happen, right? So now I'm viewing that message that you guys sent me, and there's a link to, to a story about Android taking over the world. So I click on that, and that fires up a browser. So now I'm in a, a totally other application. This is an, an, a whole other app in a different process with a different permissions, total different sandbox, all that stuff. But to a user, it doesn't matter. The user just popped up another screen, right? Um, and so right now, we're in a web view activity. So we're viewing that particular story um, um, about Android taking over the world. So, so in that story, there's a link to a video. So I click on that. And now that launches a whole other um, app, in this case, so YouTube, for instance. Um, and we now can see that actual video of little androids taking over the world. Um, so essentially, the user ended up doing jumping between one, two, three applications, okay? Uh, but at the same time, the user went from one to second to third to fourth activity, okay? So this is called a task, right? So the user create, generated a task. You can go back, back, back now to come back to where you start. So that's, that's roughly what... Um, uh, what um, the intents are all about. Um, now, one thing that's important about intents is that they can be explicit or implicit. In other words, what I can do is I can say, I want to launch such and such activity and spell it out, right? Um, which is the case that we do here, right? So when I say I want to see the particular message, I'm spelling out how I'm going to view it, okay? Um, whereas in this case, when I say, I just want to open up a web page. I'm not spelling out how to open it up. I'm just saying I want to handle this with something that's capable of rendering HTML. So it could be Firefox. It could be the built-in browser. It could be some other browser. So in other words, multiple apps can compete for the same, for handling the same activity, right? So that's so that's a feature of Android that's kind of cool and unique. That's you might have heard the buzzword: all apps are created equal. That's what allows for that. Um, capability to, to have apps compete so you can basically have multiple home screens m multiple you know uh, SMS clients address books etc so that's a little bit about intents uh, next that we have we have about four or five of these main building blocks so just hang in there and then we're gonna get back to Yamba and how we design Yamba using these building blocks so one of the things that um, you know Android has is services background services um, so these are basically things that run in the background, uh, quote-unquote background. I'll double-click on that soon. Uh, but imagine that you're writing um, an app like a music player, a Pandora or something of that nature. Uh, so you do need the UI. You need some, some way to, you know, say, I want to play this song and give it thumbs up, thumbs down, fast forward, whatnot, right? So you do need some kind of UI. That would be an activity, right? But as we know, an activity can just be wiped out by a system at any point in time. Right? Well, I would like to play the music while I'm doing other stuff. Right? So for that to be possible, our design in this case would look something like this. So we would basically create an activity here. So this would be our UI. Okay? And then uh, that UI would merely be used to start a service. So the actual playing of the song happens right here in this service. So it's owned by the service. So this guy can be wiped out, disposed off, right? Um, but the service is going to keep on cranking in the background. Okay. Now I keep I keep saying uh, a quote unquote background. Uh, that's because the in, in Android typically services run on the same thread as your UI. So be be mindful of that. You actually if you if it's something that takes a while, you actually may want to put it on a separate thread uh, to to truly put in a background. So all, all services is something that's invisible. Doesn't have any UI. Yeah. But also service has a much simpler life cycle. So life cycle of a service is start stop or start destroy, right? Um, and what the point about that is that it's less managed by the system. So what that means is that you as a developer have more control over a service. So the system is not, in most cases, it's not just going to come and wipe out your, your background task, right? Uh, so so that's, that's what you would use services for, okay? So, so that's one of the pretty common main building blocks. Uh, this is something called remote services. Don't worry about that too much. Um, 
Content providers are a way to share data across apps, right? So I keep saying how applications have their own sort of, uh, are in their own sandbox. So one app cannot access the data from another app. Well, what if you wanted to share some data, right? In my Twitter app, what if I wanted to provide the tweets to, to some, somebody else on the, on the device? Uh, so content providers provide that. Um, system uses them quite a bit. So system uses them, for example, for sharing uh, uh, media, uh, for sharing settings, for sharing bookmarks, for sharing contacts, things of that nature. So system uses it internally quite a bit, but not, uh, but not externally. Uh, developers tend to usually be users of, but not authors of uh, content providers for the most part. So this, this would be an example of how all that may work. So for example, in this case, what we have is we have um, the address book. So this is your address book, and this is an activity. In other words, it's a UI, right? And, but this, this address book doesn't have any data. So your contacts app doesn't have any data. There's another app altogether called Contacts Provider that has all the data, right? So that's where the data lives. So basically, we're separating the concerns. We're, we have one app that is UI and the other one app that's data, so we're loosely coupling them. Well, what that allows for is for other apps to tap into this data, right? So I could have some other application altogether, another address book that now taps into the same data. Or I could have multiple data uh, providers well, mashed together. So think, for example, your, co your contacts uh, provider uh, being mashed with your Facebook, with your Twitter, with your LinkedIn, and so forth, and providing more of a holistic view of, of, uh, of, the, of, of a person, of Bob, right? So, so that's something that's possible, and, and that's what, uh, you know, people take advantage of that quite a bit. So, for example, if you have HTC device, you probably have HTC Sense on it. Well, HTC Sense provides a much sexier version of an address book than the standard Android one, right? So that's, this is exactly how it works. They basically rewrite a UI, create another app, and, um, and tap, um, but tap into the same data source. So that's, that's the, uh, what the content pr provider um, is. And finally, uh, we have something called a broadcast receiver. And a broadcast receiver is basically a publish subscribe mechanism. So basically, you have some piece of code, and you want to subscribe this piece of code for some event. When something happens, I want to know, right? That something could be SMS arrived, system gets booted, battery is running low, uh, we're plugged in into power, network is down, network is up, that sort of stuff, right? So when that event happens, because you're subscribed to it, you get published a notification. And that's when your code wakes up and does whatever it does. So it's a standard, you know, pops up pattern um, um, boiled down into Android. Okay, so these are, these are basically our main building blocks. So now in the context of that, uh, we're going to look at, you know, how do you use this now to build something? And that something, uh, in my case, is that application called Yamba. And uh, so over the years, you know, doing, doing a lot of these trainings, I've had different example apps. I, I, I used to have a Sudoku game, I had the restaurant app, I had a golf app, um, different apps. And I was looking for something that's sort of comprehensive, touches all the different parts of Android in a, in a meaning, in meaningful way. So that's why I kind of settled for this Twitter example because I, I find it's very, uh, very, in a very natural way, it showcases how to use lots of different parts of features of, of main building blocks of Android. So what we're going to look at is how, we, how I built it in this case uh, through seven iterations. Um, and by the way, uh, all these seven iterations correspond to seven chapters in a book, so it's all, like, every iteration is whole and complete, um, so it's kind of nice and easy uh, chunks of code. And at the same time, uh, the code is available for free, so I just wanted to make sure you guys know that. Uh, it's at uh, uh, github.org, uh, github.com slash maracana, and if you go into learning, uh, uh, learning Android Yamba, uh, so just go to github.com slash maracana. And uh, I'll make sure I copy-paste that for you uh, later on. Um, and I'll post it to a place where you're going to be able to find it. It's hard to do this with one hand. So, okay. so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you guys have all this information later on as well. So, so this is, uh, these are some various artifacts that we're going to generate. Cool. Um, so let's take a look at this. 
so in the, this is the first iteration, right? And what we do in the first iteration is uh, we're going to build um, a capability to post to Twitter. Right? You're going to get a single screen, type in your status update, you know, I'm, I'm at the Silicon Valley code camp, bam, click update, and bam, it goes into to all your friends, right? Um, just uh, in terms of the notation, uh, because there isn't really a graphical notation for, for Android, I kind of came up with my own, so just to kind of explain what it is. Uh, the, the dotted line represents our app, okay? So this is application, more specifically it's application context. In Android, an application is sort of like a very loose term. You can't see an application. You can see application components, you can see an activity, you can see a service, and so forth. But you can't see an application. Application is just sort of holding, you know, holding place for all your main building blocks. It's kind of like the pizza dough, right? And then you put toppings on top of it. Okay. So that dotted line, that's my pizza dough uh, in this case for, uh, for my app. So what we have here is we have a single activity. So this is that screen where you get to type in what, what you do and you then click post and this makes a web service call to the cloud, okay? Um, and that's equivalent to this, uh, this is, th that's that screen, okay? So that's our first iteration, that's the first thing that we designed. Uh, one of the design principles I wanted to, like I said, have in this is that at any point it's all incomplete. So you can stop, things are working, they may not be doing much, but they're working, right? Uh, it makes sense. So, so that's iteration one. Uh, in the previous iteration, in the iteration one, we had our username and password hard-coded, right? So you didn't really, nobody ever asked you how to log in. I just hard-coded it in Java. Um, so that doesn't make it very useful to anyone but you, right? So in the second iteration, what we do is we provide another activity, in this case a preference activity, where you get to change, or a user gets to change your username and password. Um, so, so that's basically, so what's new is this activity here. And also what's new is that we now have a shared file that both of these have easy access to. So this guy is writing to it and this guy is reading from it, right? So, so that kind of shows how, you know, these main building blocks, these components, they can communicate via a file. They can basically have a secure place where they can store information that's within that pizza dough, right? So nobody else can see it other than uh, components of the application. So that's our second iteration. In the third iteration, we now introduce a service. So the service is gonna periodically go and check Twitter for updates, right? So you can set some kind of interval every five, 10, 15 minutes, go ping the cloud and see what my friends are doing, right? So, so basically the service is doing a pull in this case, right? It's pulling the data periodically. Um, it's, a, it's a good example of how to create a service to, to do that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, what we notice here is that the, 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 the code for connecting to Twitter, you need it in, in two places. You need it basically in here, because this guy needs to connect to Twitter, pull data. But you also need it in here, because this guy needs to know how to post to Twitter, right? So at the same point, we now have an opportunity to do a little bit of a refactoring. So the question is, well, what do I keep, you know, some kind of Java objects that are common between components? Uh, kind of, where do I hang them off of? Because this, this main building blocks are sort of self-contained uh, pieces, right? So where do you, how do you store, where do you put some Java, right? Um, and it just happens that there's something called a, an application object. So that application, you actually has an application object. It's typically empty, but it, it, it's a good place to kind of hang um, your, some Java. So in this case, I make that application object own the actual Twitter connectivity, right? The, the Twitter class. And so that's, that's a little refactoring that we do. So we move that, you know, knowledge from here to there, right? So this application object is readily available to all the main building blocks. So you can easily access it from, from anywhere, right? So that's, that's what we do uh, in this case. So first, so good, you guys following? We're halfway done with this. So, iteration number four. Oh, by the way, iteration number three, um, we can verify at this point. We're holding complete because we can see that the data is actually getting here. You can print it out, right? We're not, a user can't see it, 
no restored anywhere, but you know, we can verify that so far things are working, right? So in the next iteration four, what we do is we now create a database. So we actually have a local database for this app to store this data. So basically that data that we got here, we can now insert it into some kind of data structure, database. It's a SQLite database. So it also illustrates how, you know, Android provides the framework for SQLite database and how that works and, and, and so forth. And notice that the database is also within our dotted line, which means that nobody else can have access to it, right? So that's, um, and we hang that database off of the Yamba application, so it's now readily available to anyone who wants our data within our context, okay? So now we have, the, we pull the data, we got the data stored. You can shut down your phone, turn it back on, the data is gonna be there. But you can't see this data, so it's not visible anywhere. So, so that's basically, uh, you know, that's the end of this iteration in, in terms of that. So that's where we're at uh, with that. Um, by the way, um, well, let's go to iteration five and I'll ask the question. So now we have a screen. We finally built our third screen, which is probably the most important one, uh, the timeline activity. So this is, the acti this is the place where you can see what your friends are doing, right? It's corris that corresponds to this screen, right? Timeline. You can see, you know, what your friends are doing, okay? Um, so we finally built that, that activity. Um, and so that activity is basically getting the data from the status, uh, from the database that we have locally. Now, one question I usually ask people is, why didn't we just go do this directly? Or um, let me make sure you understand that this line is not related. Why didn't we just go do this? Directly. We could have, right? We, we couldn't just square the database. But then every time I want to see what my friends are doing, I would have to deal with the network latency. Right? So it would make, it, it, I, I would have the latest data, but I would have, it, it would act a little slower, right? This is what you would typically do with a web app, right? If you just did a web application, that's why, it, you know, web applications don't have a cap capability to run sort of a service and all this more complex architecture. They would have a simpler architecture, but more of a lag uh, before they show uh, show stuff on the screen. Would it make sense if you, from the updater service, sent the data directly to the screen and to the database at the same time, or? Uh, would it make sense to, um, to, to send the data directly to the screen and to the database at the same time? So basically, do something like this, right? Uh, hold that thought for another slide. We're gonna do something like that. Uh, so, you know, I'll explain that in a second. Yeah, so, so, now, so now we have a pretty decent picture. Um, things are working, you know, you, you start up this application, you make sure you start your service, your service is cranking every five, 10, 15 minutes, it's pulling data, data is getting into the database, you can see the data on, on the screen. Uh, you can go change your username and password, you can update your status, you can post that to Twitter, uh, next time service runs, it's going to put it back into the database and, and show it on the screen as well, right? So everything is nice and dandy, right? So in the sixth iteration, we now improve it via broadcast receivers. So you notice how in every iteration I'm kind of using one of those main building blocks. So we started the activities, then introduced the service, then introduced, uh, now introducing the, the, uh, the then introduce the database and the application, and now we're introducing broadcast the receiver. Remember that publish subscribe mechanism? So, this service here, uh, you know, it, it's responsible for pulling the tweets, right? Now, if I turn my phone on, I would have to remember to go and start it, right? Well, that doesn't, that's not very useful. I mean, imagine if you, for, on your phone, you have to remember to go and fire up the updates for Twitter and for Facebook and for Gmail and for uh, whatever you're using, right? That, that would be a pain. Wouldn't be much nicer if you just started by itself. Well, you can do that via broadcast receiver. It just happens that the system has a broadcast message that says, I'm done booting, right? So what you can do is you can create a receiver that says, I wanna know when you're done booting because I wanna do something like start a service, right? So that's, uh, it's a very simple example. It's basically two lines of code. One line to say, hey, I want to subscribe to when, you know, the notification that you're done booting. And another line that says, okay, at that point when you're done, I want to start a service. 
right? So it's a couple of lines of code, so it's fairly simple. So bam, it notifies that it's finished booting and it goes and starts the service, okay? Similarly, you know, my service that keeps pulling from Twitter, uh, it doesn't know if the network is done. Like if I'm, uh, if I'm flying and I forget to turn off my, uh, my, my phone, not that it ever happens, um, it's not gonna be able to connect to the cloud, at least not to that cloud, right? So, um, so I create basically another uh, a receiver here which listens to network up, network down events and does the opposite to the service. When this network is down, start stops the service and, and vice versa, right? So that's a little, couple more lines of code, but it's very useful and preserves the battery greatly. Yeah, you had a question? Is, uh, you, is there a ba battery? Yeah, so the question is, when you turn on the broadcast receiver, does it use any battery um, um, and, and so on? So, no, it doesn't, because it's this is a dormant piece of code, right? It sits there, it's not running, there's no process or anything. It's just somewhere listed as that it needs to know, it wants to know certain things. So, it just basically, it can statically register itself. It says, I want to know when the system, when an SMS arrives. And that's it, it's, it's shut down. And when that something happens, bam, it gets activated. And then it does whatever it does, but it's usually very quick. So it's very, very efficient on a battery. Unlike a service, which is actually running, it's a process that's cranking in the background, right? So service is an actual something that's alive, right? So good question. Uh, now, I have, back to the previous question that you had about the, uh, uh, you know, so the updaters, so there's a new tweet, you know, somebody just posted something uh, on Twitter. So our service ran on, you know, on its interval, 5, 10, 15 minutes, and now it knows about the tweet, right? It knows that there's a new tweet. And it does, you know, it puts it into a database and everything's nice and dandy. However, user is currently looking at the actual list of tweets, and the user is waiting to see if there's anything new. But there's no way for this activity to know that there's a new tweet. How does it know to go and pull for the updates? Does it also have to now run its own service and do its periodic updates? That, that would be highly inefficient. So what we can do is we can send our own broadcast that says new tweet, right? So not only the system can send broadcasts, but we can send our own broadcast as well. So we, it's an auditor service when it knows that there's something new, fires up an, um, a, uh, a broadcast uh, intent, and the service, uh, sorry, the activity in this case, has a receiver sort of built in that says, I want to know that there's a new tweet. Now, so, so this is kind of different than previous scenarios because this intent comes from the service itself, okay? And it's also different because this receiver is not statically registered, but it's dynamically registered. Meaning, this receiver doesn't need to be worrying about there's a new tweet unless the user is actually sitting on the screen looking at that very screen. Because why update the screen unless it's not visible, right? So, so that's kind of like a different sort of a way to, to use a receiver. Uh, so we explore both, both ways in this example. So far so good on this? Yeah. Okay, and the final, uh, the final uh, iteration is I got everything working, everything's happy. Now I want to put a, I want to create a, a widget, as in, you know, one of those widgets you put on a home, uh, home screen, right? And I want to show, um, you know, the latest tweet. So what I do is I can, I create a widget. Now the problem with that widget is that it actually doesn't live in our process. Widgets are, are remote, remote views or guests in another process, another application, namely home application or launcher, right? So although you write them, they don't run within your own sandbox. They run inside of somebody else's uh, process, namely a home screen. So what that means is that if something that runs in a different app wants to access my tweets that run in my app, I need to pierce the security call and I need to make them available. So that's where content providers elegantly solve that problem, right? So we now expose the data via content provider 
So if content provider is a simple insert, copy, delete, and query, right? So in this case, I would just implement a query so that you know your your home screen widget can query for the latest tweets, and that that solves the problem. So so that that illustrates that. So basically, in this you know seven iterations, we basically showed you know all those main building blocks that Android kind of uses uh, in, in, a, in an elegant sort of way. So so far so good on this. Um, now. Like I said, that's uh, that looks like that on, uh, when it's running. I can show you that in code as well, um, if if you guys care about that. Um, just to kind of give you an idea what things look like. Um, obviously, you know we're not going to learn all, all the you know APIs in a couple of hour in you know less than an hour. But let me just kind of give you a flavor. So um, so this is a very simple version. Um, well, let me let me do this. So it seems like a lot of you are Java developers. Um, and so how many of you program in Swing or AWT? OK. So the rest are probably web development or something like that? OK. All right. So, um, so in Java, we have a, uh, a Swing or AWT. That's basically how you build UI um, in standard Java. Um, the, the biggest difference between Android Java and standard Java is the UI. So everything that we had with respect to uh, AWT and Swing, we don't have anymore. So um, so basically, the way we do, do UI in Android is that uh, we use Android tools for Eclipse to whip together a XML uh, description of what the screen is going to look like first. So this is my screen in XML, right? It's You can see that it's got, you know, there's a big text box and there's a piece of text and you know, I can I can make it smaller or make it wider, and um, I can make this button blow up and take all the space or not. I can drag four stars here. You know, I, you can do things like that. It's kind of like a WYSIWYG drag and drop type of interface. At the end of the day, what happens behind the scenes is um, is you just generated some kind of XML. Okay, so that's it. That's XML, right? Um, it's um, you know similar to HTML uh, in terms of complexity. Um, so what you do next is in your Java you inflate that XML into the Java memory space, and that's kind of what, what, where it's different than Swing or AWT. So in so in the status activity, what we do is we now have this line here set content view. And this R layout main, it basically points to resource layout, uh, sorry, R layout status, status, right? So it's basically a pointer to that file there, which is that file that just showed you, that XML file, right? So, uh, so basically at this point, what happens in this line is that we parse dynamically uh, this XML file. And so for every single element, so linear layout, we're going to create a new Java object, new linear layer, right? New text view, new rating bar, new button, right? And then for every single attribute in XML, we're going to assign that as a property to Java, right? So somewhere it's going to be button, my button equals new button, button dot set width, button dot set text, button dot set text size, button dot set, set height, etc. Right? So at the end of the day, your XML really is transformed into Java. Right? So you're still just programming in Java. But that's why it's sl slightly different that, uh, than uh, what you might have uh, experienced before. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going, it's going to create, yeah, all these classes exist. So there is a class, there's a Java class somewhere in the framework called linear layout button, etc. Yeah, and so the, in other words, you can do pretty much the same approach you did in Swing. So you could do everything in Java and forget about XML. Um, it's just that XML makes it much easier, right? So we have this dual approach to UI. Uh, we basically describe the UI in XML because it's a good tool for that but then we implement it in Java, right? So, in, in other words, um, 
if you take a button, for example, to describe that the button is blue, he has round corners, that sort of stuff, XML is great because it's you can drag and drop, WYSIWYG, do all this kind of stuff in, in nice, nice tools. But to say what the button does, XML is not a good tool. Java is, right? So that's that's kind of it's a dual approach. So we describe it in one. I'm sorry. Uh, do you have different look and feels, uh, as in as in swing like motif and stuff? Uh, n not really. But another thing that we do have is we have ability to apply a style um, or a theme to uh, to to a UI. And styles or themes are equivalent to uh, CSS. Think of them as CSS. So, for example, if I just wanted to flip this from being white on black to being black on white, uh, I would just pick a theme dot light and bam. Now I just flipped what the look of the entire thing is, right? Just by swapping quote unquote CSS style sheet. It's really a, sty a style property, yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly, and thanks, thanks for that point. So, uh, at some point, yes, so we need to, so we now inflated this XML. At this point, we have all the Java stuff in our memory space, right? How do we now get a hang of it? How do we point to so it? How, how do I make a change to a, uh, touch a listener to a button or something like that? Um, and to do that, you have this thing called find view by ID. Right, so that's kind of how you locate a specific element that you inflate it from Java, and then you get the variable. So there's my, at this point, I have my added text, I have my, you know, button, and so on and so on. So my my button, I can attach a listener to it, and so on. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with DOM, uh, doc, right, it's kind of like like in JavaScript, you have a find find element by ID, by ID, right? So it's the same idea, right? So that's ultra fast. That doesn't take a long, a long time to locate something that's already in, in memory. This tends to be an expensive call, although it's an in, in innocent looking call, but it does a lot of sort of processing, uh, parsing XML and creating a whole bunch of Java objects. So that's why you want to kind of be mindful when you create your XML because you don't want to uh, nest, or overly nest like layout within a layout within a layout uh, to create a certain, you know, appearance. Uh, because all those layouts are going to become objects, and object creation is something that is always expensive in Java, I mean, which means slower running app, right? So be mindful of that. So there's some other layouts that that, that uh, uh, help you with that. So far, so good. Yeah. So is there a way to actually generate code from XML? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I haven't seen that, uh, but it should be fairly straightforward. I mean, somebody could write a script to do that. Uh, view the generated code from XML? Uh, no, I don't. Not that I know. Should be possible. Um, you, if you if you decompile the Java code, you could see the generated code. Yes, yeah, you could you could you could do that. However, you're not going to see any any anything different because this is this happens at runtime. So find view by ID actually. Uh, so this, this line is actually processed at, at runtime. It's not a compiler, um, um, you know, um, specific. It's not it's not an instruction to a compiler. It's actually it's at the runtime that, that gets processed. Um, so, so that's a little bit about you know a UI in in Android. Um, um, so we we keep, we build it. that's how that's basically what that first iteration looks like. Um, if you wanted to know a little bit about services, um, a service is a, a, usually pretty straightforward. Um, sorry, that was in iteration three. Uh, So a service is pretty straightforward. Um, it basically, you know, you, you, you override certain methods. So what you're gonna notice in Android, uh, you don't start from scratch, you don't start an empty class. You usually subclass something that comes from the system. So like you sub, if you wanna create a service, first you subclass the system service and so forth. Yeah, that was a question. Uh, 
St uh, st uh, the, is there a, th a transition diagram for service? Yeah. Diagram for the uh, for the sorry for which one? But they are, all the activities have the same um, uh, state state that diagram. Yeah, all the activities are going to go through this state diagram. And and by the way, when you write these activities, um, like you know, when you write activities, services, receivers, providers. If you guys get the lines and circles, if you get the design principles, getting that to a Java should be fairly straightforward. Um, I actually kind of wrote, you know, because you kind of subclass the same methods over and over again. Um, I, I wrote a little um, temp set of templates so that you can kind of copy paste that. And it's uh, it's been recently just published uh, under a bookshelf um, it's called the main building blocks tutorial. So then, so then, for example, for activity, you know, I have an activity template. So I say these are the commonly overwritten methods. Uh, this is how you typically would write an activity, fill in the blanks, that sort of stuff. So Java is sort of, you know, there's not a lot of thinking to convert the lines and circles into your design into Java. So don't worry about Java too much. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, now. Um, I wanted to, I know initially we were going to talk about tablets, so how, much, how many of you care about the differences in tablets and, and, and all that stuff? A couple of you, okay, quite a few. Okay, so let me now show you, uh, so that was the design of the version that I did of Yamba for, for the book. Um, and so this is the other one that's running inside of the emulator. Um, and let me change, this is cool feature. Easier to see, right? Um, on the projector. So you just flip the color, flip the, the, the skin, the, the style, right? Um, so basically, this is a uh, now a uh, it's, it's con connecting to the real Twitter in this case. It's not using my um, myyamba.maracano.com. There's a there's a diff there's another reason why I, I, I don't use Twitter.com in the previous example, and and that has to do with the fact that Twitter no longer uh, allows simple authentication. In other words, you cannot log in with username and password anymore. Right? You need to use OAuth. How many of you know OAuth? Okay. So just because it's it's not commonly it, it's it, you know it's a whole other tangent about how OAuth works and, and so forth. So that's why I didn't bother implementing that in the previous example. But this example does use OAuth. And that's why it's actually talking to, to the real uh, Twitter. Uh, so what, what I'm doing here is, first of all, I have a, a, one of the key features, new features of um, tab for tablets is that you have fragments, right? So this is a, uh, this is my activity. In this case, in this application, I have a single activity. Just one activity, that's it. All the other components that used to be activities are now fragments. And I just flip-flop them inside of the screen. Uh, and I'm not sure my UI is the best designed UI, but uh, yeah, I, I, I use this area to flip-flop you know, the, the fragments, right? So for example, if you want to update something, and no, obviously it's not, something's not doing very well. Um, if you want to change preferences, for example, um, it crashes. Um, so let's see. So, so that's what it looks like. That's that's how you change the preferences, um, right there. So basically, I'm using this area for that. So it's a single activity, multiple fragments. So it's a different design altogether. Uh, that's that's a big deal. Um, and I can show you that in the code, the way I, I've done it. Um, so let me just close all here because it's. Uh, not related, bam, so for this one I need to actually change the workspace, unfortunately. That's gonna take a second. So one difference is the fragments. Another difference uh, with uh, Honeycomb is the status, uh, the action bar. Um, so we no longer use a menu. We have the menu sort of here. So you don't have the button to press to open up a menu like you have on a phone. Like on a typical phone you would have menu and bam, it shows up here. 
okay? Um, so instead, here you have it show, showing up here, so I can do like a search, I can press this to post a new message, this is a refresh, and this is, uh, you know, preferences, uh, changing the team, and, and a couple of things like that. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's what's different from UI standpoint. However, from programmer standpoint, this is automatic. So in other words, if whatever you did previously for menu, it's just going to look different. You don't have to do any programming changes. It's the same menu file. Right? So pre in the previous example, we defined menu. Uh, menu is yet another XML file that looks like this. Um, resources menu. So it's an XML file where you define, you know, your items. Let me show you an XML so you can actually see the whole thing. Um, and let me make font bigger because you can't see it. So let's say 18. That should be fine. Oh, that didn't work. Um, okay. That works. So um, it's it just basically a bunch of items. So it's exactly the same as the previous versions. Same code. There's one new attribute, and that's this attribute that says, you know, show as action if room. So in other words, you can say, you can specify if you always want it to be shown, or if you want it to be shown only if there's space, or never sh show it, or so always if room or never. And what that is going to result in is that you're going to have certain things appear behind this dot, 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 right? So you have to kind of expand and see it. So that's the only new, new thing when it comes to the menu. Um, other than that, um, the other new thing is uh, something called loaders. So we had, uh, um, in the previous um, version, um, we, we had to basically uh, use adapters to load the data for this list. And with uh, Honeycomb, we now use loaders. So it's a slightly different paradigm. And I'm just going to show you really quickly. So first of all, my code here, back to fragments. Uh, my code here, so I have a single activity that is responsible for everything. Everything else is a, a, uh, um, is a fragment. And if you look at the layout, it's actually much simpler. So, so notice that I have a very simple activity, uh, uh, single activity. It's got one fragment. That's the fragment that rep represents the timeline. That's the stuff on the left-hand side, right, what, what my friends are doing. And then this is a placeholder where I'm dynamically going to attach whatever other fragment I want. Okay? So with fragments, they're sort of these reu reusable pieces of UI. They're not quite activities, but you attach them to activities. Yeah. Um, so can you think of them as a, as a, as a pain? Like a, as a, is, that, is that what you asked? Um, so you can think of them as a pain, but they also have a, they, they do have a little bit of a lifestyle. Uh, life cycle as well assigned to them. So uh, to attach them, actually, you have to create a transaction, um, which you then commit and all that. So they, they're they not just a static piece of UI. Um, so there's a little bit of initialization and cleanup that happens and so on, yeah. Uh, can you think of fragments as widgets? Um, widgets are designed to live in somebody else's container. So they are what's called the remote view app widgets. Um, so they, they, they behave differently. Um, applet is basically, so here's what applet was, uh, uh, here's what a fragment was designed for. Uh, take email, for example, Gmail, right? On a standard phone, I have a list of messages, and then I click, and then I flip to the other message where I can actually see uh, what's going on with that particular message. Um, now, with tablets, we have a more real estate. We have a bigger screen. So we can now support multi-pane sort of email, right? I can both see what the list of messages and a particular, read a particular message. 
So that's what they were designed for. Um, and uh, so they're basically reusable components that live inside of an activity. So you can, you can redesign them. You can also support multiple devices. So for example, if, I'm, if, I'm my, if my app is now deployed on a phone and I have a small screen, I can go to a model where things are on top of each other, right? With the same UI, so it becomes a reusable UI. So, in this case, this fragment is, is declared here statically, right? It's just hard-coded. Whereas in this case, this, um, this is going to be a placeholder where I'm dynamically going to attach a, uh, one of those. And it took a little while to figure out how to do this, but basically, um, what I, I, if, if you click on Compose or if you click on Preferences or if you click on uh, one of these, I have a single method that call, it says, go ahead and, and show a fragment, right? And you specify the path to the fragment or the, the, uh, the package. So th that's going to point, in this case, for example, if I want to see preferences, that's going to point to my preference guy, right? Here. OK? Um, so now, what does show, uh, show do, show fragment do? So show fragment does this. It basically gets the fragment manager, begins the transaction. The flip side of that is you commit to that transaction. Right, so you need to you need to start stop a, a transaction, um, and then you want to basically uh, pop pop it from a back stack if it's already there. You um, and you can design this differently, but I didn't want to. The, I didn't want my back button to flip, flip, flip inside of that area. So that's why I pop everything off of the stack. Right. Otherwise, if you click on back button, it would be just going back within that one little area, because you can also have the stack for your fragments. So you open, open, open fragments, and you go back, 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 it's just gonna roll back those fragments. So it, it just depends on what kind of behavior you want for your back button. Yeah. Um, so basically I check if the fragment, uh, I try to find it, so find fragment by tag. You can find it by tag or ID. Uh, the tag in this case is the actual package name, so I, I find that easier. And then if fragment is found, if it's not found, then we're going to instantiate it and add it to the back stack. Okay? Otherwise, if it's found, we're just going uh, to set, set that as, as the fragment and we're going to commit, commit a transaction that actually shows it. Okay? So that's, that's just a little bit of a, of a code behind that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Android has its additional libraries. So when you think of Android, uh, when you think of Android's Java, it's basically it's Java standard edition minus UI and some other stuff. So pretty much you have everything else. You have the networking, the I/O, the you know all that stuff. You just don't have Swing AWT that's been replaced with its different UI. Uh, and you know, you're missing like reflection and a couple of minor things like that, but everything else is there. No, they're not. This is uh, fragments are not part of a sun. This is additional. This is a package called Android Dot. So, uh, so that's the standard Android uh, framework. Uh, yeah, I think this is the first. Uh, can we use uh, JRuby or other languages? Uh, it's a great question. Let me, um, yeah, let me just uh, point out. There's a slide. There's a slide for that. Uh, so, so this is sort of this is how standard Java right it works, right? You com you write Java code, you compile it, you run it on JVM. In Android, we write the very same Java code. We compile it with the very same JC Java C compiler, but then we recompile it with Dalvik executable, we get the Dalvik bytecode and then we run it on top of Dalvik virtual machine, okay? Um, so, so these steps are new, right? Uh, what that basically means is that anything that compiles down to Java bytecode is fair game. So if you have some libraries you wanna, for example, my J Twitter library, I just found some random Java Twitter library, dropped it in and bam, it gets recompiled into Dalvik and works. You're, you, you're agnostic to the fact that this is Dalvik. Anything will work. In terms of other virtual machines, to answer your question, um, so anything that can compile down to, 
uh, JVM code, uh, Java byte code, it, it will work. So we're seeing a lot of traction we, with, uh, with uh, Scala. Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, Jiton um, and JRuby are also interesting. So people are doing, doing uh, more and more that, that, that kind of work. Uh, yeah, the, go ahead. Yeah, there's also something called Rubato, R-U-B-O-T-O. It's JRuby based. Uh, I forgot the person who wrote it a couple of months ago. His name is John Sakara. He's a committer on the JRuby uh, team. So apparently this works quite well. So that's another uh, option. Um, so, and we actually, so we run San Francisco Android user group and Java user group and a couple other user groups. So most recently we had uh, the talk from one of the core contributors. That's what you're referring to, right? So, uh, so check it out, maracano.com. Uh, it's got a whole talk on what Rubato does. Yeah. So, so, the, so the question is about fragments and handling the events. Uh, so you can have a fragment handling event or you can pass it up to, to the activity. Uh, so it really depends on who uh, is, first of all, subscribed to. So if you add a listener in your fragment, you're going to get a notification, right? You're going to get a callback. Um, and then you have a chance to handle it. So there's usually in the API, depending on what kind of event it is, but usually return true if you consumed it false otherwise. So if you return false, then the normal processing is going to continue, which means it's going to go up the stack to activity to be handled and so on. So, so that's usually the API is, is based on the listener observer pattern. So you, you register your button to want to know, and you, you're, you get a call back on, on click, for example. And then your on click says, true means I got that event and I handled it. I, I, I want to consume it. Nobody else needs to know about it, right? Or it says false, meaning it got the event, it didn't care about it, it just let the normal execution happen, which would mean that now it goes up to the parent, in this case, activity. So, make sense? Is there a reason you don't want to handle it in a fragment? And, um, well, sometimes, uh, 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 so sometimes you may have some, uh, some common functionality that you want to keep in the activity and then more specific uh, functionality in a fragment. So in my Twitter I, um, you know, example, for example, you know, there are certain things like menu processing that's going to be part of the activity because it belongs to the whole thing. But maybe a specific fragment modifies the standard menu and adds a button to it. So in that case, it's going to want to know about menu clicks but it's going to ignore all of the activities menu clicks. It's just going to care about its own. So that would be one, one example. There was a question in the back, sorry. Why do fragments need to be in a transaction uh, where activities don't need to be in a transaction? Um, activities are actually, are actually in a transaction. It's just the transaction is managed by activity manager. So at the system level, they are inside of a transaction. Somebody, somebody else, the god of Android, manages their, their life cycle. With fragments, we are sort of those gods, right? So you get to dynamically attach and deattach the activities. Uh, so, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. So that's uh, sort of why there's a need for a transaction. I'm not 100% sure why it's somewhat complex uh, in my mind, the way they designed it. So I, I'm not 100% sure about that. Yeah. So there's a question about How do you dynamically change the UI between uh, the, uh, the, the type of a screen you have, like a uh, phone versus uh, uh, this? You want, one simple way would be to create, just uh, um, um, use alternative resources. So for example, in this case I have layout, which is my default layout. I could have uh, layout dash x, uh, what's the, uh, extra large, right? And, and that, I would just, in that case, my main would look different. Right? It would not be, have this layout. 
So in other words, I would just have multiple copies of this layout for different size devices. So you can do that using just a standard alternative resources. Yeah. Uh, would my Twitter app run on tablets? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can uh, we we can do we, we we can launch it since we have both both things. Is the binary going to work? So if you have a you want to have one binary, you should have one binary. That is the best practice. That's back back to the question. You know, you should have one binary uh, that that just accounts for the differences in the screen. And it's the, the, the only difference would be that main XML file in my case. Yeah, you could say my minimum SDK is 1.6, and I'm, but I'm shooting for 3x. Yeah, you, you, can, you can do that. Um, so, um, and, and fragments are supported. Fragments are, are, are created for the um, uh, honeycomb, but are supported in gingerbread and uh, in Froyo, I believe. It's a, there's a backwards support. So you can have fragments today. On a lot of devices, yeah. Uh, back. So, what are the best practices? So, so how would you ma make it the uh, look the same on, um, say you have the same binary, basically it's back to the same. So the same binary with the native look and feel. Um, again, you can just do that via providing multiple XML files. Uh, so you can, you know how in, in, in Android it's gonna match for the best, uh, best fit. So you can specify your constraints um, on the XML files. So, so that's how you would do it. Like, for example, if I wanted to, you know, just really quickly, if I wanted to create my a new resource, a new layout, right? Like, for example, I have a layout, I don't know, timeline here. If I go file new Android XML, right? I can uh, specify, uh, let's say, time timeline XML. So I'm saying, oh, this is a duplicate. It says it already exists. But I say yes, but this time around, I want to account for a, a, a size, for example, or screen height or orientation. So I can pick the size like extra large. I, I believe ex, extra large is a tablet, right? So, so now I to just create an alternative version uh, of my file. So I would basically now have two copies of timeline XML, and one would be for you know one type of a screen, the other for the other. But your Java code uh, stays the same. That's the uh, nice thing about being able to split concerns, right, between Java and, and XML. So you have now another timeline which would now be designed for, you know, a different. So in this case, it's for tablet X, W, X, V, G, A. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Uh, if you want to move things dynamically in, inside of a UI, yeah. like so what, what kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. So um, uh, so um, you guys, so that that stuff that we've done with uh, with Java inflating the XML. So for example, uh, timeline activity, right? So we had this to inflate from XML, right? This parsed all this and got us Java. You don't have to do that. You can still do button my button equals you know new button, button dot set text, right? Just like you did in Java. So you you can do everything dynamically 100%. Yes, back to Java. Yeah. You have a question there? No. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Do you need a separate XML for your orientation? It really depends on what your app is. So certain applications are going to look good regardless, right? But if, if, for example, if my app, when I turn it upside down, there's no room because the keyboard covers half the space or something, 
then yes, you would you would account for that by creating a different uh, layout. Yeah, yeah. If you decide to write your own, uh, if, if you had your own AWP code, how would you load it? You can't. In AWP libraries don't exist. Um, the principles are the same. So you still, just like in AWP, you have a container and component model. Um, in Android, we just call it layout and view model, but it's still a composite pattern, right? So it, the principles are the same, um, and uh, you could do the same things just with a different API that you did in AWT. You couldn't, you couldn't take over the legacy AWT. That wouldn't work. Uh, but, uh, but this provides even more because of the XML and plating. Um, by the way, b before you guys uh, totally uh, uh, leave, I just wanted to uh, point out that this is where the slides and video are going to be later on. Uh, so that's the shortener, um, just this thing here. So if anybody cares about this, all these artifacts that I've been talking about, I'm going to make sure I post it. Uh, it's right now just a placeholder. Um, and supposedly put down a QR code for all this. Um, but um, we still have 15 minutes, right? Oh, we are, okay. Um, so, oh, I, I, yeah. We started at quarter to two, so that runs till three, right? Well, I just keep on talking until people leave, right? Um, I have questions, so. Yeah. Exactly. If you're a uh, as a Java developer, the biggest difference is the um, UI and the main building blocks. Basically, that's what my talk was about today. Like, uh, as a Java developer, you need to understand the main building blocks. So, activity services, providers, receivers, those lines and circles that we drew, right? And you need to pick up a little bit of a new API. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. It takes you like about three to five days to master. Android if you're a solid Java developer. Uh, tools in terms of how nasty your application is. Uh, there are tools. Uh, there's, a, there's something called TraceView, which will allow you to trace the execution of your code. It comes, it's part of SDK, so look for trace view. Um, you need to generate a trace file between point A and point B, and then you can analyze it for CPU consumption, memory consumption, that sort of stuff. It doesn't do battery. For battery, there's a battery service, so your coach, it has a way to report how much it's using, and then you can analyze it. But again, you need to augment your code with reporting uh, stuff. For UI, there's something called hierarchy viewer. It's a very useful tool to analyze anybody's, um, you don't need the source code of the application to analyze how nasty its UI is. Um, and it's basically, um, you know, UI, you get the most bang for the buck optimizing. Um, and, and this tool helps you see how, you know, do you have unnecessary nesting of, um, you know, classes, objects, and that sort of stuff, views, right? So, so it's a very useful tool. Yeah. Uh, uh, gestures, I'm not, I'm not that sure. I, I don't know much about that. I'm kind of like agnostic to that. It just kind of works, yeah. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Hope you learned something. <laughs>